So if you've finished with the exercises, you can check yourself uh, by looking uh, at the files in your studio. So do you have our studio open? So if you click on the file called 05umis.rmd, this it will contain all the information that you can see on the web page and also it includes the solution to the exercise. So on the website you don't see the solutions, but if you want to check yourself afterwards, you can go to the files in your studio and check the solutions yourself. All right? Have you found it? In your R studio, file number 05. And if you go to the end of it, you'll find the solution. And basically all for all the exercises that we have in the course, you can always find them in these files. The numbers of the files are a bit different from the website, but you can still figure out how, where, where the solutions are. Okay, so I'm Davis, and I'll talk through the next section of the course. And this is just an introduction into the computational or analytical framework that we use uh, and we'll talk about some of the sort of the infrastructure that underpins the analyses we'll do and specifically this is bioconductor as a whole uh, something called single cell experiment uh, which is a data object that will contain the data we use I'll explain that and a package called SCADA uh, that sort of provides some useful tools for navigating uh, single cell data sets and doing QC. So has everyone here heard of Bioconductor before? Some yes, some no. Um, so Bioconductor is a repository uh, that contains a lot of software packages written in R specifically for genomics and bioinformatics. Uh, if we want to use the Wikipedia definition, it's a free open source and open development software project uh, for genomic data. And all of those, those three key things are really important to us uh, as sort of methods developers and users and teachers. Um, so it's, it's free, obviously, uh, free as in beer, uh, but also free as in you can use it to do whatever you want with it. Um, it's open source, meaning that people who contribute methods and packages to Bioconductor uh, show they're working, as it were. All the code that they use in their packages is available for anyone to look at. Uh, so that is really powerful um, approach to doing development because it means that other people can more easily build on work that people have done uh, and it's also a great way to catch errors. If other people can look at what you've done, um, they might find bugs and contribute to that. And over about the last 15 years or so, um, Bioconductor has become a really large resource for the bioinformatics community. So there is something like 800 packages in Bioconductor available at the moment. Um, it has two releases per year. Uh, one of those releases is today, uh, so you're right on the cutting edge of the <laughs> current release of Bioconductor, which is a bit stressful for Vlad uh, putting together the course, but uh, you have the benefit today of um, getting a very first look of the next, the, or what will be the current uh, Bioconductor release for the next six months. Um, and so it has this nice uh, approach as a user where you get access at any given point in time to uh, the release version of Bioconductor, which is meant to be stable, you sort of can work with that for six months, and then at the end of that six month period, you can upgrade to the next version of Bioconductor, um, and then you get an updated version with all the work that the developers have been doing over the past six months to improve their packages and methods and all that sort of thing. Um, one gotcha with using Bioconductor tools is that it's closely linked to the most recent version of the R software itself. So. Um, in using these tools, it does pay to keep up to date um, to the extent you can with the latest version of R and the latest version of these tools. And that's uh, you know, generally good advice when using any software is to keep it updated uh, as much as possible and it holds true for this as well. One of the things we really like um, about Bioconductor is it's, as well as its approach to releases, uh, is that it has a lot of quality controls built into the project. So when packages are 
submitted to Bioconductor, they're reviewed by the in-house Bioconductor team, so R and bioinformatics experts, and uh, also the, the packages in Bioconductor are checked, they're built uh, overnight, every day, uh, on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. So um, I think more than any other source of software in bioinformatics, uh, you have a very, the highest sort of chance of success with Bioconductor packages that you should be able to install them um, on any platform at any given point in time. And inbuilt in that is also checks on the, the validity of, of the, um, the results that the packages present as well. So as well as the sort of the vast array of contributions that people can and have made uh, to Bioconductor, there are also some really useful sort of infrastructure that the Bioconductor core team maintains. And that sort of often happens out of sight of the user, but there are some really powerful ideas that underpin uh, the use of Bioconductor for hands-on day-to-day data analysis. And a key part of the Bioconductor work that the, the core team has done over the years is developing methods and specifically classes. So that's a class is uh, a particular type of object in R that contains data and information in a defined structure. And so Bioconductor has developed these classes that make it very much easier and more reliable for developers to build tools and for users to do analyses. And one of the key ideas which is um, adopted in this single cell experiment class, the fundamental idea is that we want to have data and possibly in many different guises for a given experiment or study contained along with metadata information relating to that data set. And we want to have it in a specific class where we know exactly what to expect from the class and so we can manipulate it in very reliable ways. So one of my great fears as a bioinformatician is that I have some matrix of data in my environment and I have some sort of annotations of that data and I decide that I want to you know, subset some cells out of this matrix and I need to correspondingly update my annotation as well and if they get out of whack then I could inadvertently make mistakes like calling genes the wrong thing or misannotating cells, assigning them to the wrong group or whatever. And so the bio bioconductor classes, which are quite strict in their structure, um, help us avoid mistakes like that. Uh, so as we'll see, uh, what single cell experiment makes relatively straightforward is the ability to do simple things like subsetting the data set. So like saying, okay, we don't want to use these cells anymore. We want this subset of cells, or we'll take this subset of genes, or we'll only take the cells from this particular group and we can do that sort of subsetting and manipulation uh, in a very reliable way, knowing that when we choose a set of cells we want, then the corresponding cell annotation information will be uh, brought along reliably with it, and similarly at the gene level and so on. So to speak a bit more specifically about the single cell experiment class, um, this is a new class uh, introduced uh, into the release version of Bioconductor in this latest release. Um, and so technically speaking, it's an S4 class. Um, you don't need to worry about exactly what that is, but R has several different types of class. Um, S, uh, single cell experiment is an S4 class, which means it's a stricter type of class. And it's been specifically designed by uh, a group of developers engaged with the Bioconductor project uh, to support single cell uh, experiments. And fundamentally what that means is we can contain our expression data in this object cell annotation information, gene annotation information, and also some specialized methods to store and retrieve things like spike in information, uh, dimension redu dimensionality reduction coordinates, so PCA or TSNE representations of cells in a lower dimensional space that can be stored very conveniently in the object, uh, and size factors for normalization and things like that. In addition, we can also have metadata about genes, libraries, processing in the data as well. So, um, it really gives us so one reliable home for almost all of the information uh, we need to conduct an effective analysis. So it's uh, defined in a package called single cell experiment. Uh, so we can load that into an R session. Uh, and this gives an example of constructing a single cell experiment. So you can see there's a little bit of effort up front to actually build the object in the first place. So in this case, we're simulating uh, Poisson counts to give us a count matrix. 
Uh, we can assign row and column names to that matrix, as you can see in the code there. And then this, there's a function called single cell experiment, uh, which produces this object SCE, which is this single cell experiment object uh, that we'll use, uh, we'll demonstrate here. And so the important sort of bits of jargon, I suppose, that you need to know when interacting with the single cell experiment object are that we have an element of the object called assays or assay data. And that's where our expression data lives. And the nice thing with this is those, it's designed to be quite general. So it's called assays. That's a you know, very general term. And the nice thing is that within that assays element, we can have various different representations of our expression data. So here, we've defined a list with an, uh, the count matrix as an element of the list called counts, and where that's forming uh, the assays element of our single cell experiment object. But what we can do is extend that so we can not only have a count matrix as expression data, but we could also have, say, normalized counts as another expression matrix in our object, or log scale normalized data, which we often uh, use for visualization and dimensionality reduction and that sort of thing. And so this is where the sort of the extensibility of single cell experiment is really useful because in the same object, we can have several representations of our expression data, uh, which is often necessary for the different sort of tasks we want to do in a single cell RNA-seq analysis. There are two other sort of lines you can see in that uh, call constructing the SCE object. One is defining the row data. So we're in this sort of bioconductor paradigm where we, sort of for conventional and historical reasons, uh, we have rows representing genomic features, so genes as we mostly think about them in this context, and columns representing cells. And so the row data in a single cell experiment object uh, contains the gene annotation information, and the col data in a single cell experiment object represents the cell annotation information. And so they're data frames. Um, so obviously here, there's not much going on with these. We've just defined gene names and cell names as our row data and col data, respectively. Yeah? Dimension. So, so the quest, yeah. So the question, as I heard it was, um, so will the different expression matrices you could define always have the same dimensions? Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so the question was, if, if we get a matrix from 10x versus a matrix from SmartSeq2, will the matrix look the same? Uh, Depends on what you mean by look the same. Uh, yes, so in the sense that when we construct our uh, single cell experiment object, regardless of the source of our expression data, we'll always want to form the expression matrix such that the rows represent genes and the columns represent cells. So it may be that uh, from what, whatever source we've obtained the data matrix, someone might have given it to us the other way around. So cells as rows and genes as columns. In that case, we would want to transpose the matrix to get it in this particular form because that's what uh, this particular data class expects. Yeah. Yes. So in this example, uh, there's not any subsetting yet. We've just uh, set up a matrix, like a small example matrix that happens to be yeah. 10 genes by 10 cells. Yeah. So we'll get to examples of subsetting and, and manipulating these objects later. This is just showing us how we can make one in the first place. Yes? So what's the uh, difference between this type of uh, data object as opposed to like summarize the experiment or all the ones we use so far? Yeah, so the question was, how does single cell experiment differ from summarized experiments and other um, objects that might have been used for bulk analyses? Um, so single cell experiment actually builds on summarized experiments. So in bioconductor terms, it inherits 
summarized experiment. So in that respect, it is a summarized experiment in the same sense that uh, a pug is a type of dog. Um, a single cell experiment is a type of summarized experiment. Uh, and so methods that work for a summarized experiment object will also work on uh, a single cell experiment object. What single cell experiment does is extend summarized experiment in specific ways. And the way it extends summarized experiment are adding these things about uh, ability to store and retrieve spike in information, uh, the dimensionality reduction uh, coordinates, and specifically the size factors. So when we were discussing among the developers what we wanted in a single cell experiment class, we wanted to leave it fairly general. Like we, don't, we didn't want to sort of overload it. But uh, when we were thinking about doing single cell uh, analyses, we're thinking spike in information so common and needs to be treated carefully that we want that as a core feature of the class. Uh, and again, dimensionality reduction, you just will always do, as far as we can tell, for any single cell um, analysis. So we want to have that as a sort of core element of the class. So they're the specific things that are not present in the summarized experiment that we think are useful for, for building on here. OK, so in a single cell experiment object, uh, the user can assign arbitrary names to entries of the assay slot. So we can have something called counts, we can have something called expression, have something called log CPM, or whatever we like. Um, but to assist with interoperability between packages, uh, some suggestions for what the names should be for particular types of data are sort of uh, provided a priori based on what we think are, are commonly needed and used things. Uh, so there's sort of a defined counts name, which we intend to store raw count data. So that might be uh, the number of read counts per gene, per cell from SmartSeq uh, to data sets, or the UMI counts uh, from a 10x data set. Uh, there's norm counts, so the name, uh, which uh, intended to be normalized values on the same scale as original counts. So counts divided by a cell-specific size factor that are centered at one, or something like that. Um, log counts uh, are commonly used, so log transformed counts or normalized counts. Um, and most commonly, this will be sort of log two transformed norm counts, uh, so, and often with an offset of one, so we're not trying to take the log of a zero value. Yes? So the question is, for normalized counts, does the size factor come from the total number of counts per cell or from something different? Was that the question? Yeah, total number of UMIs per cell. Um, that's, yeah, that's a, they're done in various ways, but that's, loosely speaking, that's a, an appropriate way to think about what the normalization size factors are doing. Although, uh, we can discuss this further in the normalization section. Um, but typically, the actual computation of the size factors is done in a specific way to try and account for uh, potential composi compositional differences between cells, which mean that the raw total counts, whether that's UMI counts or read counts per cell, is not uh, the best way of defining what the size, quote unquote, of the cell is. So um, it's slightly more subtle than just the total counts but it's also not completely dissimilar to the, the total counts per cell. And um, in a sense, we're trying to get at what information, how much information do we get out of that cell and adjust that to sort of make that even between the different cells. Yeah. Uh, so log counts are very important and we'll use them a lot. So when we do things like um, PCA or TSME plots, uh, they'll be working from the log counts element of the uh, the single cell expression uh, experiment object. Uh, we also have CPM, so counts per million, um, so read count for each gene in each cell divided by the library size, um, or transcripts per million, like we might get out of uh, Salmon or Callisto, one of those quantification methods. Uh, so each of these particular uh, suggested names has uh, an appropriate, what are called getter and setter methods, meaning that there's a function with that name where we can apply the function to our object and we get the matrix out, or we can assign 
new values to, a to that uh, element in the object. So the example here um, is, so we've, we've got counts in our object, so this example takes those counts, so the counts, counts SCE extracts the, uh, the expression matrix. Here we're taking the log base two of that matrix with an offset of one and assigning that to the norm counts slot in the SCE object. And so you can see after we've done this, uh, run this line, if we look at the SCE object, if we just print it at the command line, uh, or the R prompt, then we see it defines the class as a single cell experiment, define, tells us the dimensions, so it's 10 by 10, so 10 genes by 10 cells. We haven't added any metadata to this object yet. We have two assays in the object, counts and norm counts. We can get a peek at the row names, of which there are 10, get a peek at what's in the row data, so the gene annotation information. We get a peek at the column names, and again, at the column data similarly, we don't have any reduced dimensionality uh, representations of the cells at the moment, and we don't have any spike in information yet. So this sort of what we print, what we see when we sort of show the object um, in R gives us this sort of summary of the information in the object at any given point in time. So we can take the dimensions of so norm counts, and as expected, that's 10 by 10, and if we look at this norm counts, then this is uh, showing us the values, so those, in this case, log two counts, um, which we could also quite appropriately store as, as log counts in this object. Okay, so that single cell experiment um, class sort of underpins the analyses we'll do, and the big advantage of it, before I get to the skater, is uh, so for the user, it's reliable and convenient. You've got your data and your annotation information packaged up into one object uh, that you can then carry around and manipulate safely. Um, the other big advantage of it is that if the data is in a well-structured, defined class like this, then developers can <coughs> develop methods uh, designed for this class where they know exactly what to expect. And that's really important for a developer trying to develop robust methods and software that won't break at, you know, when the wind's blowing the wrong direction. Um, if your data is in a single cell experiment uh, object, then I know as a developer that I can expect to see count data in there or I can expect to see log counts. That I know where to go to look for cell annotation information. I know where to go to look for gene annotation information. And so this is a, this sort of, Class-based development is a really powerful idea that has driven a lot of bioconductors' success. And uh, what's really nice now is that a lot of bioconductor developers are taking uh, advantage of this single-cell experiment class now. So if you put in the, the bit of work to get your data into this class, then there are a lot of uh, bioconductor tools now that will operate immediately on that single-cell experiment data. So that makes it a lot more convenient for a sort of a workflow once we package up our data in this class. Uh, then there are a lot of methods that will immediately operate on the data in that format that make life easier for us as users. And so it, it helps out the developers. Um, so the other thing we'll mention is sort of the, the infrastructure for our analyses uh, is the SCADA package. Uh, so I wrote this package uh, with help from several colleagues, so uh, take everything I say about its uh, various virtues with the appropriate grain of salt. Um, but we like it for providing useful methods for quality control, data visualization, and pre-processing um, as a sort of doing some important necessary steps uh, as part of our single cell workflow before we get to more specific modeling like pseudo time analyses or clustering or differential expression. Um, it's just a fact of life that uh, even when the sequencing and the experiment has gone well in a single cell study, uh, there'll be a great variation in the performance of the cells and the quality of the data we get out of the individual cells. And so QC at the cell and gene level is, a, is a, just an unavoidable fact of life for doing single cell analyses. Yep. Yeah. 
So the, the question is, if we have data from different platforms or technologies like 10x or SmartSeq2, uh, will we need different normalization approaches to take into account the different specificities of the different technologies? Um, the loose answer is yes, uh, although there are many commonalities between things we'll need to do, whether the data has come from 10x or SmartSeq2 or, or something else. Um, so we will cover this in more detail in a normalization section. So I think if you're happy, then we'll, we'll postpone deeper discussion for, for then. Because it, it is an important and broad topic um, that I think uh, yeah, warrants, warrants lots of discussion. Um, so the SCADA package is a bioconductor package. It uses the single cell experiment class as of this release. Um, and so gives us the ability to do things like automated computation of QC metrics. Uh, you can do transcript quantification from read data with pseudo alignment tools like Callisto and Salmon from within R. So if you're more comfortable in R than at the command line, then that can be useful. Um, it adopts this data format, the single cell experiment that's become the standard in Bioconductor. So uh, that means it interacts really nicely with the downstream tools. So if you put your data in a single cell experiment object, use SCADA for the QC, uh, then you retain that data in a single cell experiment object that's ready to plug into many other tools that other people have developed. Uh, it provides a lot of visualization tools, uh, which I find very useful. It's integrated in Bioconductor and also, which we'll discuss later on, um, offers some simple normalization methods that can be useful. So. Uh, we highly recommend using SCADA, but of course we would say that. Um, but it's the basis of this part of the course. So um, I'll show you this little diagram, which can uh, lay out some of the workflow um, for doing QC, filtering, normalization, that sort of thing. Um, I wrote this figure when SCADA was still using an older type of data structure called an SCE set. Um, so in the, you know, the, the release that's coming out today of Bioconductor, um, we've switched over to using single cell experiments as the, the data class underlying it. So everything in this figure is still correct. You just need to mentally substitute uh, single cell experiments for SCE, um, SCE set objects. But what we can do, so at the start, whether we've, we've got uh, raw RNA-seq reads in FASTQ format, or we've got uh, a data matrix defined from some source. Um, we want them in a single cell experiment object now that, as I've said, contains that assay data, cell data, gene annotation data, and all that sort of thing. Um, there's a function called calculate QC metrics, which does what it says. Um, you apply that function to the object, has various options, uh, but it will do sort of automatic uh, calculation of a lot of metrics that we find useful for doing QC, both at the cell and the gene level. And after doing that, uh, there are also various plotting approaches that can give us an idea um, about the performance of various cells in our data set. So the plot QC function has a lot of options for doing that. Um, we've got dimension re dimensionality reduction plotting methods, so plot PCA, plot TSNE, plot diffusion map, and a more generic plot reduce dim function all let us uh, visualize our cells in some sort of reduced dimensional space, which can be very useful uh, for QC and then downstream for actually doing sort of biological interpretation of a data set. Uh, so with the QC metrics, we can filter features or genes, we can filter out cells, um, and we'll discuss strategies for doing that uh, in the next little chapter. Um, there's a normalized expression function uh, for doing simple normalization, so sort of basic size factor normalization. Another function just called normalize, uh, which works well with the SCRAN package for uh, size factor normalization of single cell data, which is useful. Uh, and Normalize Express uh, also has the ability to, you can provide it with, a, with covariates that you would like to regress out of a data set. And so that should be done with some caution because depending on um, the particular circumstances, it may be more or less appropriate in a given study, but um, that function does make that easy to do if you decide it's something uh, sensible to do for your analysis. Uh, there are many other plotting functions which we can get to, uh, things that make it easy to uh, use Biomart to annotate genes. So often we might start with like ensemble gene IDs, but we want to know what chromosome, position, strand, biotype, uh, HGNC symbol, that sort of thing. Uh, so there are functions to make that easy. And the object here is that starting from, say, a count matrix or a single cell experiment object, we can do the necessary QC 
um, do some sort of exploratory data analysis of our, of our data set relatively easily, uh, annotate things if we need to, and then at the end of the sort of the SCADA workflow, we've got a nice clean and tidy data set that's ready for analysis um, with downstream tools, so whether that's for clustering or uh, pseudo time analysis or differential expression or anything like that. So that brings us to the end of that little section. Uh, and it will take us into a coffee break. So the risk of being the person who's stopping other people from getting coffee. Are there any uh, final questions on this section before we have coffee? And then afterwards, we'll talk about QC. No, people desperate for caffeine. Oh, one. It is best to switch, but in the latest version of, um, of SCADA, there, there are two possible functions uh, which do exactly the same thing. Update SCE set, which uh, I kept that because there used to be a function called update SCE, SCE set. Um, so update SCE set or two single cell experiments will take an SCE set object and return a single cell experiment object. So if you already have your data in a SCE set object, it's just a matter of running that function on your object and then you get a single cell experiment object that you can use with the latest version of SCADA and other tools. Yeah. Okay, let's have a coffee break. <laughs>